The story began a year ago when he was still a human, but now he has become the master of that monster about ten years ago, when the monster genes began to emerge in the human body. After these genes awakened in the human body, the person would definitely mutate into a monster. That's when the human brain was filled with hunger and insatiable desires, controlled by an unknown consciousness from within the heart. That's how our MC became a monster, with hands and feet ready to destroy the world. No one would ever think that those who had changed had any trace of humanity left in them. Suddenly, a bright light flew in front of him. It was a girl telling people to leave the monster to her. Then people started running away. The girl shouted our MC's name and attacked him, saying not to let the mutation take over his mind. He wondered if he was hesitating as the smoke disappeared. The MC did not attack the girl, making him wonder if he was really hesitating. He happily thought that a monster losing its mind would not hesitate to act like that, and wondered if he could be brought back to his senses. But our MC shook his head and let out a loud roar, preparing to attack as the blow got closer to him. He stopped her before hitting her, and she touched him while crying. He punched her happily, telling her that he was back. When he tried to restrain himself, another monster came and they started growling at him. He tried to fight the monster instincts while the girl cheered for him, but he couldn't control himself. The girl smiled, then punched his stomach while he roared loudly. He then ran with force, slamming her into a rock and making her lose consciousness. She stared at him then slowly raised her hand, telling him not to let himself be controlled by the monster any further. Then she closed her eyes, thinking it shouldn't be like this. Her eyes slowly turned human, and she gently lowered him, calling his name. It was at that moment that he finally regained control as the monsters rushed at him angrily. With one strike, he destroyed the monsters attacking him, sending some of their body parts flying. Three higher-ranked monsters noticed him and all lunged at him, punching him forcefully multiple times, solving the problem in the process. When they hit her, he told himself that he would not accept it, and if he could regain control before, it would be different. Then he called Jay's name while spraying cologne, thinking that he was torn apart by another monster. At that moment, he touched his eyes and realized that they had turned back into humans. He slowly put down the cologne and looked at the acceptance date, June 15th, 2025. He thought today was the sixth day after the college entrance exam, the day before his genetic test, and tomorrow was also the day he would find out that his genome contained that monster gene. Then he would have a locator installed in his body, and he would be discriminated against for being afraid. Just like some people, like a time bomb, he saw on the side and the girl in the bathroom told him so he could hear her saying the names of other women that made him blush while staring at the women in the bathroom. Thinking that now he finally had a new chance in life, even though he couldn't do it, called a good person. Suddenly someone knocked on the door and his phone started ringing. He saw that it was Goo telling him that the chicks were by his side, W2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 and now he knew that he had brought a girl back to the hotel room for his 18th birthday, and they might be in front of his room. Now, he begins to remember his past, and thinks that he will definitely protect her in this life. He thinks that he cannot change the fact that his body contains the monster gene, but he promises himself that he will definitely control it fully in this life. He thinks that he needs to be fully prepared when his monster gene fully awakens, and he still has one more year before that happens. He promises that this time he will make those monsters control him and destroy that world. Suddenly he feels something in his heart, and his arm starts to change. He is shocked to see his hand mutating and thinks that he shouldn't have awakened his mutation a year earlier than planned. But the main reason for the awakening is when someone's emotions surpass a certain threshold and he definitely has already surpassed it when he woke up. The girl comes out of the bathroom and asks what's wrong. He looks at her side and thinks that he should slightly advance his plan. The attractive woman comes out of the bathroom while he is checking her bathroom, but he realizes that he can still control it, at least enough so that no one else will notice. He takes his jacket from the floor. Knowing that he had some time left, he planned to free himself from the romantic debt he had acquired. He then informed the woman that they were all just close friends. He was right because he was a bad person, 
and didn't deserve all of that. So he opened the door to his room and found six more women waiting for him. He simply told them that they all had to go their separate ways from now on. However, one of the women asked him why he said that when he had been waiting for her to reach the legal age for so long. She questioned how he could say that to her. The women gathered around him and asked him to let them share their actions together. They all wanted to try it just once. He didn't realize how tempting he was making it for her. It made him think that he always had something for older sister-type girls, so he ended up with a group of girls that fit his description. Then he ran to tell them that he brought G the monster and accidentally hurt them all with his powers. It was all in his mind and they had to break it. The women chased after him, asking what he meant and saying they didn't mind if he became the carrier. A minute later, he reached the lobby and found out that all the women were cheating because as soon as they found out he was the carrier, they left as quickly as they came, except for Gu. Now, she was still waiting for him. He asked if his heart had been shattered by his seven friends and offered him some yan, and Bao suggested that it might cure his promiscuous nature by gently touching his face. Jay made him wonder why he was acting so strange and sensitive. He thought he wouldn't make him wait any longer and wouldn't let him regret having him. He leaned closer to his creation, shyly asking what he was doing and if he was trying to take action against him now. But then his heart started pounding harder, making him change and curse because the monster gene was hungry. He asked if he was okay, and he answered that he was just hungry, knowing he needed to deal with it first. Then he ran off screaming for him to wait for him at home, promising to find him afterwards. He was surprised and asked where he went when he was hungry. A minute later, he looked at the store while remembering that based on statistics, about 5% of the population are carriers of the monster gene disease. This is one of the reasons why society does not fall into chaos. Only those who have the gene that can mutate into monsters. He also often knows those people. They say that as long as they can control it, those who may become monsters in the future by restraining or even killing them after they change their will. Society remains peaceful, but this is mostly about morality because in reality, most ordinary humans would not hesitate to kill anyone who has this gene. A while later, he thought he found food and suspected there was another mutant attack happening in the cinema. People in the commercial district were running away while screaming for help and being chased by a monster. One person who was running begged the monster not to eat him, but when he saw the sin, he wondered why the man was just standing there. The man thought if that's what happened, he pushed him towards the monster while shouting at him to keep moving forward and just die. But the monster ignored him. The man thought that it seemed like the monster thought he was one of them, so he smiled at the man pushing him, thinking that he could eat without worrying about him. The man was surprised to see this and shouted, asking why the monster didn't eat him as he thought it was impossible. But then he remembered another reason why the society didn't do it. Destroyed, but those who had awakened the power from within, known as the Transcendent, had established a special department called the Destruction Department that built individuals blocking monsters using a stone wall while he headed into the cinema, leaving the monsters to face those who had awakened. The man asked him to partner if everyone in the district had been safely evacuated. But his partner replied no because Lynchy was still inside. He told his partner that considering the level of damage that the monster must have had, a second-ranked monster was born. But Lynchy was a skilled fighter, so there shouldn't be much of a problem inside the cinema. A big explosion occurred. Lynchy thought he lost his arm as a replacement for the three children. It was a big loss for him. The monsters jumped towards him to attack, but he just activated his metal fire and slashed the monsters in front of him. Lynchy couldn't believe that he had lost his arm to a rank two monster, and his reputation as a skilled fighter continued to diminish. Suddenly, a person appeared and punched the monster, causing it to retreat. Lynchy wondered who this person was, as they seemed more confident than Lynchy himself. He knew that it was impossible to defeat a rank two monster with bare hands. He also wondered where this person, Xing Kun, came from, what his powers were, and how he became so strong that the monster attacked the ceiling. While Xing Kun looked at them, thinking that this place also needed cleaning, 
Lin Chi warned him not to let his guard down because rank two monsters wouldn't die so easily. He ran towards them and told them to come help him. He led them to a safe place, saying that he could handle the rest. However, Xing Kun called him, confusing him. Then, he apologized for what he did and headbutted Lin Chi on the forehead, causing him to fall unconscious. Suddenly, a monster appeared behind him, ready to attack. Lin Chi daringly turned around and told the monster that he misunderstood that part and changed his arm, saying that his prey was here. He struck the monster's arm, causing it to explode into pieces while the monster was confused. Then he punched its face while the monster recognized his arm as the flame of God and asked why he possessed it. He replied that he might not believe it, but he had once been their master and even had the experience to support it. While he pinned the monster to the ground, the monster roared and asked if he was going to eat it because they were of the same species. The monster told him that they were all the power of the king and asked if he wanted to take over the king's power, calling him a traitor. While another monster watched them, he bit the monster and asked what he meant by the big boss with a terrifying figure and told the monster that he had decided to do it by devouring what they called their king. Then he slowly tore apart the monster's flesh, while the monster told him that their boss wouldn't let him go so easily. In the district, there was a loud commotion, and the man was confused as he looked at the monster because they seemed weaker for some reason, and they didn't seem as united as before. Before he said that at least it was easier to face monsters like that, the boy asked his lieutenant about the situation and the lieutenant replied that there were higher-ranking monsters among the lower-ranking group who would cooperate with him as their leader. But seeing that they were losing unity, it meant that Lin Chi Ung killed his rank's two monsters in the district. The boy replied, saying that Lin Chi Ung was extraordinary, and he was envious of his ability to control his power that surpassed. The lieutenant said there was no problem there and decided to check on Lin Chi. He didn't notice that there was something leaking under his feet. Then. The lieutenant called Lin Chi, and, as he suspected, the rank two monster was already dead, and he realized his arm was missing. There were even three children beside him, and the boy told him not to worry. Even if he lost his arm, his strength could still be shown off as much as he wanted. He saved the three children, stopped the monster horde, and even killed the rank two monster. Lin Chi said he could still kill it, holding back his missing arm and told them that it wasn't him. He told them that there was an idiot who knocked him out cold, and after killing the monster, when he woke up, he thought he saw Xing Kun eating the monster. He also realized that Xin's left arm felt burned by something blue fire, and told them that he had done it, seeing Xin's face behind the hood, and he could recognize him if he saw him again. The boy was shocked, and asked if he really saw Xing Kun eating the monster's flesh, and also asked if he was sure that Xing Kun wasn't the monster itself. Lieutenant Kata noted that there was a case of monsters eating other monsters, but if that was the problem, Lin Chi would also be eaten. So Lieutenant thought that he had the power to defeat the rank two monster and forcefully intercepted the extraordinary pest extermination rescue operation. They would issue an order for the transcendental person whose strength was not registered suspected of having muscle-strengthening power with attributes of metal or possibly fire attributes, and suspected of suffering from personality disorder and antisocial behavior, someone who goes beyond limits and has such pride and arrogant attitude, thinking that they would do a much better job than those trained to do it, and someone like that would definitely go out of control in society in the future. It is better to eliminate them with permission, as long as they still can belch and think. While they say that the initial stage of evolution is the easiest, it is still surprising that he will evolve directly to rank two. He decided to go home and was surprised that his house was still intact and the apartments in the area were still standing. At that time, after dealing with all the girls, it was already three o'clock in the morning when he returned and the entire community was experiencing a power outage. Not only their own, but also a large area of the residential district was affected by the blackout. It was clear that all the electrical energy had been redirected and absorbed by the XU in his house at that time. Due to the early awakening of his superpowers, he had lost control over it 
and accidentally destroyed the entire apartment complex where he lived. There were 136 people in the building at that time, including his parents, who died. This incident caused him severe mental trauma, along with the visible scars on his face that would not heal. He saw the time on his phone and noticed that it was already past 11.30 p.m., around four more hours until 3.30 a.m. He thought he still had enough time, but he couldn't help but wonder why the streetlights should have gone out around that time and what was happening inside the apartment. Zhu Yu was about to touch her phone when suddenly the electricity went out. She looked at her hand and realized that he couldn't move. If she did, the electricity would leak and cause a power surge. Panic started to spread through her body as he felt trapped and unable to move or speak loudly. She wondered if this was what they called an uncontrollable awakening, as he could feel the electricity flowing through him continuously. Her body began to tremble, and he feared that if he lost control now, she might end up harming her parents. Her hair began to fall out, shining, and she realized she couldn't hold it any longer. She begged someone to come and save her. Suddenly, Xing Kun appeared and assured her not to worry because he was there now. She asked him how he got there, but he explained that there was no time to talk and asked her to trust him. She quickly agreed, holding his hand, and warned her not to scream no matter what. She felt scared because it might wake up her parents. She was confused when she saw Xing Kun. His arm was black and she could feel the electricity flowing through her body redirected to him. But he seemed fine. Stepping back, he told her that he couldn't maintain direct contact with her for long, apologizing for what he did to make her confused. Then he threw her out of the apartment, saying they should head to the roof. She was shocked, then covered her mouth, afraid she would fall. Xing Kun jumped out of the apartment, catching the air, telling her to hold on to him as he devoured the previous second-ranked monster. He gained a new ability called Tentacles, which he used to reach out and pull himself closer to the apartment. Landing safely, he told her he would go electrocute it to death and urged her to release all her electricity there. He pointed to the sky and told her to pour it all out there, to which she agreed. She opened her mouth and released all the generated electricity into space. Xing Kun was relieved because they arrived on time while gradually noticing the fading electricity, and he thought that now the unfortunate event from the last time would not repeat. A few seconds later he was fine, and he observed Jen's arm while his arm returned to normal. He told her that she had mutated into a monster, but luckily she could suppress it just with her left hand. He began to feel sad and covered his mouth, calling himself an idiot. He told her not to say it out loud and not to tell anyone about it. He explained that many people in the world hate monsters, and she would be in danger if she was found out. He suggested that she could forgive herself, but she only mocked his words. He asked what he was laughing at because it was a serious issue. He grabbed her shoulders and told her that he would be honest with her since she was the one asking, and the only one in the world he trusted unconditionally. He answered while looking at the stars, telling her that he was sure she said the same thing to her other seven boyfriends but she replied that of course it wasn't him who told her, even if it was a shooting star. He will not close his eyes and make a request with him around, but he tells him what nonsense you are talking about. He thinks it might just be someone from a genetic research laboratory. And since he lost control of his powers when he left, causing the commotion earlier, they must have suddenly come to find him. An old man and a nurse went to the roof, the old man said they found him lying on the roof and thought one of them was most likely the one who emitted so much controlled young power. The old man said they didn't need to worry because they came from a genetic research institution and asked who among them released the electricity. G answered that it was him. The old man told him it was okay because he did it. Now prevent a lot of damage by being on the roof, he ordered Nurse Zalu to give them reagent tests for the transcendent they followed. The old man told them they might have also awakened some powers that exceeded limits. He was not hurt at all. In the midst of it all, many electrical appliances were out of control. He then instructed Gu not to worry because they only needed a little of his blood. Gu agreed. The elderly man placed Gu's blood in a reagent, and it shone so brightly that the elderly man was amazed. He wondered what kind of godlike reaction it was. 
He also mentioned that Gu would surpass the record for having the highest percentage of genes beyond Jin Shing Kun. He informed the nurse that Guo was indeed wasting their valuable reagents on him. While the nurse looked intensely at the reagent, she screamed at the elderly man. The man told her that Shing Kun also had genes beyond Jean in him, but the reaction seemed very weak. After a long answer, the man took Shing Kun to the lab for further testing. He was surprised, confused, and thought that maybe it was just a faulty test tool, and that he only had a monster gene in him. But he remembered when the exterminator got his arm bitten by the monster and devoured it later at the genetic research facility in Transcender Detection Room 13. The nurse was shocked because he had the lowest amount of transcendent genes ever recorded in history, only 1%, which she told him was an incredibly low number of genes. However, he possessed a strong body. He believed that after his mutation, his body became stronger as a result. Then, Politely asking the nurse if he could put his clothes back on, he wondered if the presence of transcendent genes within him was due to his half-monster body or the result of devouring a monster that had consumed some transcendent flesh. He pondered on whether obtaining more transcendent genes would help him gain entry into the Nuanu Institute, which was far superior to the continuous testing for monster genes and constant monitoring. As he put on his jacket, he asked the nurse if he could still enroll in the Nuanu Institute with only 1% transcendent genes. The nurse replied that the dean of the institute had stated that he did indeed qualify for enrollment as long as he had some transcendent genes. She added that from now on, he would be considered a senior. She advised him to rest, assuring him that she would help him with the registration process. He thanked her for her assistance. As they opened the door, they saw people running into the hallway. They followed the commotion outside the hallway and overheard that they were conducting attribute tests. They decided to watch it, as they had been so preoccupied with their 99% mutated monster genes that they had not paid much attention to the chaos caused by the results of the transcendent space detection. The people behind the glass were amazed to see Gu withstand 500 volts of electricity without harming Xing Kun who stood behind him. Upon hearing the sound, the crowd discussed it extensively, amazed by the extraordinary resistance and wondering how much longer he could endure. They also mentioned someone from a few years ago with similar attributes, who had 89% of genes that exceeded the limit and could only withstand 1,000 volts when awakened as a test. As the tension continued to rise, the voltage was increased to 600, 700, 800, 900, and 1,000. But Gu remained unharmed. The spectators were astonished and began to question whether he was still human. The examiner increased the voltage to 2,000 volts and asked if he was still feeling okay. Gu calmly replied that he felt nothing. The audience was shocked by the immense voltage, especially for someone who had just awakened. They had also heard that when someone surpasses 90% of genes, their strength will exponentially increase with each additional 1%. They were convinced that this was happening to Gu as the tension continued to rise to 2,800 and 3,000 volts. However, Gu suggested that they stop, mentioning that he had not fully released all the absorbed electricity yet, and he was concerned that it might continue, possibly causing him to lose control and accidentally destroy the place. The examiner immediately pressed the button to stop recording at least 3,000 volts as a reference, without limits as before. Just then, Xing Kun asked the examiner to allow him to enter because Gu was his friend. The examiner XP explained that he could not allow entry at the moment because Gu still had a large amount of electricity in it. The man asked him to release most of it first so that he would not accidentally hurt anyone. Suddenly, two men arrived and ordered the man at the gate to open the door and let them through. The man in a suit greeted the bespectacled man named Dean Fan and asked if he wanted to enter. There were some protective clothing on the side of the observatory, but Dean's fan replied that it was not necessary as he would not be harmed by a little electricity. The man next to him, Shiji, could help him release some of their electricity. They entered and closed the door. Shiji greeted Ju and told him not to approach his electricity, as it might hurt him, 
and he needed to find a way to release some of it. He activated his fire and told him they arrived just in time because the fire could help block some of the electricity. He also assured him that he would not accidentally hurt anyone. He reached out his arm to him as his fire slowly disappeared and told him that he heard his funny name from the researchers there. Then he introduced himself and said that he would be his classmate in the future at the Nuan Sao Institution outside Xing Kun. Sembarut was frowning as he watched them through the glass and thought that She must be targeting Ju, acting as if no one there noticed him. He also thinks that She looks like a dog who greets a lion and tells him there is still electricity flowing through him, so he cannot hold his hand now telling him it's okay because they still have time to get to know each other. Besides, he also tells him that he will not disturb his rest for long, so he has something to do, saying something that surprises Shing Kun outside of what he says when they start their academic year. They will be separated into several groups, and their task results will determine how many resources they receive. As the third young master of the Fan family, he is tested to have 90% high-quality surpassing genes, and he hopes to form the strongest team in the Institute and receive the best resources for their growth as a team. He hopes he will join their team with Stern facing a pleasant response and thanking him for inviting him, but he tells him that he already has a friend in the same group with him, making him wonder what he means by the person with him where he agrees. While Shing Kun enters, She stares at him and tells him his reaction test results are too weak, so his AG percentage will not be too high. Perhaps he also told her that the strong will remain strong, while the weak will always be weak, and teammates should not hold back each other if they are weak. He hopes she will reconsider later. Xu happily greets Shing Kun and tells him that it seems they will be teammates and classmates in the future. Fandine's fans call him Fan Shi Zai and tell him that they still have other matters to attend to at the approved institution. She informs him, hoping he will consider her proposal later. In the office, Fan Shizai tells Dean Fan that Gu is a genius, surpassing Jean with 95%, and he wants to bring her into their family. Dean Fan replies that he already has someone, and it won't work no matter how hard he tries. He tells She that if there are any obstacles, she should remove them. Someone reports to Dean Fan that the Zin test results only show a 1% surpassing of Dean Fan's genes. Dean Fan says that someone with only 1% transcendent genes is the same as a normal human, and registering at the institution would be a waste of their resources. But the man insists that the dean insists, which angers Dean Fan. He says that it belongs to him, and those words mean nothing. He instructed She not to worry about Shing Kun as long as he did not appear in front of them. She replied that Dean's fan really knew his stuff while she looked at Zin's hand and asked Shing Kun if he needed to keep nursing it continuously to stop it from causing problems and if the side effect was his left hand mutating. He told him that he was right and sometimes it would make him want to eat human flesh. He confidently told him not to worry because there were many evil people around surprising him. He told him he couldn't just say that easily, and his way of thinking was also dangerous. Suddenly the door opened, and the nurse told Gu that his parents were waiting in the reception. He said that was great, and whispered to Zinka not to worry because she was good at avoiding trouble so they wouldn't get caught easily, and told the nurse that he would share the good news with his parents. Shing Kun thought it was not his problem, even though he stared at him and told him he was happy they could be in the same school again. He walked past the nurse and thanked her. The nurse answered with a sad expression. Shing Kun asked the nurse why she looked sad and if something had happened. He apologized and told her that her registration had been rejected because they said someone with only 1% transcended genes is no different from a normal human. She asked him if he didn't do it, saying that anyone with any amount would be able to register. He answered with frustration at what they told him and wondered what the leaders were thinking. He told her that it didn't matter if she only had 1%, if you have it, you have it. He would help her reapply, and if the first time didn't work, he would work for the second time. He turned around and said that even if it meant applying for the 800th time, he said it all to her truthfully and thanked her for her efforts, but said it wasn't necessary. He also told her that they were the ones who had the authority to determine such things, and she could get into trouble if she kept doing it. 
Trying to help her, he thought it was the worst of the worst. She had to use her monster genes to get into that institute. The institute had all the resources she needed to become stronger, so she had to get it no matter what. Suddenly, his phone rang and informed him that they were considering that he had the needed gene, and they were now giving him another chance for registration. He smiled knowing he had done it. The opportunity was now somewhere. Shay was angry and wondered what they were thinking because they gave Z the chance to participate in the final test. According to them, those who could not awaken their powers within a year at the Nuansau Institute were pushed out, and the final test was made as the last chance for them to stay at the Institute. He wondered why they allowed someone who was not a student to participate. He thought no matter how hard Shing Kun tried, he was still no better than a moth. Dean Fan asked Fan Shizai to come in because moths were more annoying than usual at that time of year. Fan Shizai entered, and Dean Fan told him that the final test was Kinch's idea. Fan Shizai asked what the Dean of Genetic Research at the Institute meant and why it was his idea. Dean Fan said it was his way of warning him not to cross the line, and he did. He was already upset because they had broken the rules. He thought if Shing Kun actually passed the test, it would embarrass them all unless Shing Kun failed. Then it would make the dean look like he was protecting his own reputation. Fan Shizai told him that they should prevent Shing Kun from dying or their family, and his reputation would be ruined. The dean's fan firmly stated that Shing Kun would not pass because his genes were only 1%. He also mentioned that Kinch's actions would prove that he was wasting resources and not worthy of holding the dean title. His task was to test and ensure the safety of testing equipment within five days at a place where a man named Lee dropped his phone and his friend asked if he was okay because he was acting strange. Lying slowly picked up the phone and said he was careless. They decided to leave because they still had a lot of work to do. When Lee saw his phone showing a $1 million deposit, he thought it was not in vain even though he lost his job before he told his boss. Everything was done. He had done a complete background check and found that Shing Kun did not have strong support. The boss smiled and praised him for his outstanding ability. He looked at Zin's profile showing only one gene that surpassed and wondered if Shing Kun stabbed his family's fans and even paid 10 million for the deposit and a total of 20 million for his failure. Five days later, he watched Shing Kun on the monitor and thought he was unlucky. He was surprised because Shing Kun looked thin as if he hadn't eaten for days, facing a monster like that. Shing Kun seemed destined to fail. Shing Kun was very hungry, his energy was almost completely depleted. He was so hungry that his chest felt like it could touch his back. He also had a strong urge to consume the people there because their bodies still contained inactive genes. Then Lee came and told them that there would be three rounds of life and death matches and three tickets to continue their studies. He also reminded them that this was their only chance. Opportunity to return to the Institute. Why did he say he almost forgot that there were 18 of them and the dean allowed one additional participant that day, which confused the participants? They saw him and lied, convincing them that they didn't need to guess his background because he wasn't a student and it didn't matter. He emphasized that it was fair because three tickets were still three tickets and asked if they were ready to take them. When they were attacked by a monster, they stared at him angrily, wondering what the meaning of the fair's lie was. Some suspected that Zin's wealthy family bribed their way through, while others believed that the test was rigged. Zin glanced at them, thinking he had some enemies, but quickly dismissed the thought. He started to drool thinking about food, but restrained himself from eating the person you pointed out in the testing room. Zin asked for a lie if he did it intentionally, making a lie. He asked what Zin meant, and Zin smiled and lied to stop with sarcasm because he could sense it from where he stood while lying, smiling in return. He sank, touching the gate and mentioning that there was blood there that would attract the monster's attention. He informed the lie that the blood came from a high-ranking transender. F was surprised by Zin's knowledge and asked if he offended someone who might be his family's fan again. Lee closed the testing room and warned Zin that when the test started, all the monsters would rush into the room. He added that unfortunately, 
It was used as the 18th testing room, and it would be terrifying. If there is only a damaged metal key with Lee engraved on it, reminding him of a monster five times stronger than a human and released at that moment as difficult as the metal, it would be disastrous if it breaks, because they will tear it apart and turn it into delicious meat food because of their taste. He points out and tells him that his chance to stay safe now is the door behind him. If he goes through it, he will be fine, but it also means he gives up on the test. He explains that they will not stop him. They just want him to give up his registration rights, and they do not want his life like this. He has to give up. He will be safe, and they will get what they want. Everyone wins. He slowly walks away and tells Shing Kun that he will give him ten seconds to give up. Zinkan opens the gate call lying and explains that he is not his delicacy. He lies getting angry hearing this and tells him that they will see how long he can last in the control room knocked on the door by Li. He tells his boss everything is going well and he bets Shing Kun is really scared right now after hearing it. The only way to survive is to give in to the boss's smile and think that it should take ten seconds for the monster to reach him. The room was silent as he lied that he bet one hundred dollars that Shing Kun would give him that amount in five seconds. Li laughed and agreed to the bet. The hole in the wall slowly opened, and a monster roared, eager to jump out, and the announcer declared that the final exam had begun. They both smiled, and the boss said he would start the countdown, but Shing Kun surprised them by kicking the gate open. He looked towards the camera, making them wonder if he was trying to die. Three monsters attacked him and he called them and called them food, but the monsters ignored him and passed by, thinking he was one of them. He looked back, thinking he was really hungry. Lee was shocked as the monsters ignored him, and the boss said that the blood on the gate might attract them more than Shing Kun. Lee said he didn't know he was helping Shing Kun smear blood, but he wondered how Zin's bad genes must be. The monsters surely didn't want him there. They saw Shing Kun slowly taking the ticket, but the boss smiled and thought, what if Shing Kun could be the first to be more than just a monster there? A second-year student who awakened his genes during a recent attack a few days ago. It was special because his powers mainly affected the mental condition of his target. He appeared behind Shing Kun, trying to grab his ticket and said it was his. Then he used his mental intimidation to make Shing Kun look back. However, Wan's mental intimidation did not work. Instead, Wan, seeing the monster inside his head, began to sweat profusely and wondered what was wrong with Jean's mind. W took a step back, afraid, his nose starting to bleed, and he considered Zin's mental strength to be much stronger than his own, which he could not handle. Zin's power reactions, why did they appear in Shing Kun, made him wonder what Shing Kun was, and he felt like Shing Kun was more like a monster than a human. Then the monsters sensed their presence and turned around. Both monsters attacked them. Wan believed they were chasing them now. Slowly, he turned around, thinking he knew they wanted to eat the person behind him. Unfortunately, because he was so hungry, he slowly reached out his hand and begged the monsters to let him eat them first without them realizing it. Then a small monster appeared in the palm of his hand, and he placed his hand on the monster and consumed a little bit of its essence. He smiled, thinking that finally, after days, he had received a delicious monster meal and thanked the monster. However, he was surprised to see the monster attacking him, but he managed to dodge in time, frowning and telling the monster that he had only eaten a little bit, and now they saw him. In the control room, the enemy lied and was angry because Wu Yin was useless. He thought it was okay because Shing Kun would eventually be killed by the monster. Wu Yin called him an idiot because he couldn't kill the monster, but he was stunned when he saw Shing Kun grab the monster's neck while Zingan avoided its attacks. Why did they consider Shing Kun strong? It seemed like he knew them well and attacked them based on instinct. They say that after someone has enough experience fighting monsters, killing them becomes a habit. But one blow from the monster and Shing Kun was in trouble. However, he still found the courage to attack every weak point of the monster. But can he really kill them? Shing Kun's tears caused one of the monsters to split in two and then turn around and tear apart another monster. 
Wu Yin was surprised and thought that maybe that's why Xenon's mental strength was so strong. He must have killed many monster people in the past. Li was also surprised and asked his boss what they should do. His boss smiled and told Li not to worry. The other students surrounded Xing Kun and asked them what they should do now. Xiao Shang told him that it's normal to be a little scared because it's the final test for some of them, especially with him bribing his way in and they won't let him go so easily. He asked him to hand over the ticket. Wan told Xiao Shang not to anger Xing Kun because he is dangerous. He called Wan useless trash and said to give up even before he attacked him. It was embarrassing because he considered him his strongest rival before that. But Wu Yin told him that he didn't do it. Xiao Shang ordered everyone to surround him and they would take the ticket from him. Xiao Shang was reminded by someone else to remember what he said about fighting evenly for tickets after getting them. Xiao Shang replied not to worry because he had already said that the winner would treat the loser later. Then he turned around and said it to Baldi that he would leave him with the monster and not let it bother them because they would take care of it, caring for the person who bribed them there. Baldi replied that it was not a problem. The other man told Baldi that they needed to lure the monster away. But Baldi said there was no need because if Shing Kun could kill two monsters that easily, it meant someone had made the test easier for the monster to launch an attack. Baldi told the other man that it might make the monsters hungry before releasing them there. Then he punched the monster's hand saying he wanted to score a goal too, but his fist bent, and the monster hit him in the face, throwing him hard to the ground, surprising the other man who called Xiao Sen really stupid and thought his muscles grew into his brain. He looked back at Xing Kun and saw him launching an attack. Xing Kun cursed and thought he would kill him if he used his left hand, then his left hand actually transformed, and after eating the second-ranked monster, his hand was also upgraded to the second rank. Now he could release a tentacle that was about eight meters long, and he was at least ten times stronger than an ordinary human. Even when he is not in a real monster, he possesses the power of a top-ranked monster, and one blow can free his brain from his skull. He cannot truly kill someone now, so he decides to be gentle. His blow lands on Xiao Shang's face, sending him to the ground, surprising the competitors nearby. He thinks he is exaggerating himself. He grabs Xiao Shang and asks if he is okay and tells him not to die on him. He notices Xiao Shang is still breathing and thinks he is okay. Then he releases him. Xiao Shen looks at the other competitors and asks if they still want their tickets. The man holding Baldi is running away from the monster asking Xiao Shang for help because Baldi has been injured by the monster and he cannot hold it back any longer. Xiao Shang trembles as he asks for help and offers to pay 50,000 for it. He apologizes thinking he has bribed his way in and the ticket is his to keep. He agrees to help and looks at the camera. Li is angry because he thinks they are all useless and he does not believe they have all backed down. The boss tells the control room they need to put more pressure on the participants and release monsters, number 21 to 23. The control room tries to argue. However, the boss insisted on releasing them, and they agreed. Lee informed his boss that the monster above number 20 is the top-ranked monster and much stronger than the usual rank 1 monsters. He didn't think the child would survive if he encountered them. The boss replied that Xenon wouldn't die because he might awaken his power. Even if he didn't, he was already halfway there and facing stronger monsters would help awaken his abilities. Lee asked if they should do it and the boss explained that the monsters numbered above 20 were inside the experimental zone, separated from the release zone by a door facility. He ordered Lee to open the level 2 release gate and destroy the main and backup power supply of the test participants. Lee started sweating because without electricity, the electric door would be useless if the release gate was opened. The ERS monsters would rush in, including the 15 rank 1 monsters in the release zone, not to mention the 18 top-ranked monsters in the experimental zone. They would all rush into the testing area in a short time. They wouldn't be able to escape using the emergency button, and they would all be eaten by the monsters, as the boss had told them. That's all the participants were prepared for, death. When they decided to participate in the test, it was normal for them to expect death which made it a surprising lie to tell their boss Chen that they couldn't do it because they would face a death sentence if caught. 
When asked why they didn't give up on the task, Chen replied that it was a duty given by a famous fan family and asked if he knew what would happen if they didn't do anything. After receiving so much money, he told him not to worry because he would make sure he didn't get a death penalty. He also offered to give him a reward of 10 million for the trouble and send him out of the city if he wanted, asking if he was interested. Now lying down, sweating, he agreed to do it at the testing site. Zinan punched the monster with one hit, leaving Xiao Shang amazed and thinking how hard it was to imagine what Xing Kun had gone through all this time to get that strong Xiao Shen. The beaten face happily told him not to worry about that promise, because he will do it, make sure to go through with it even though no one will pay him, he will pay from his own pocket, even though he may not have much money. He tells her not to worry because his sister and he will work hard for the money that hit his sister's head, and ask her why he brought her into Baldi's testing room to recover, and he must return to his place, said Xiao Shang, whose neck was only half broken now and he broke it. He then apologized to Xing Kun and thanked her and told her it was okay. They slowly lifted Xiao Shen and he said they would have dinner together afterwards and it was his treat. But he didn't answer. But he smiled and teasingly replied that it was okay because he had already eaten. But then suddenly he was surprised and told them to watch out because there was a big monster above them. Xiao Shang looked confused and then he pushed his sister and the other man who was on top of the big monster fell. Xiao Shang made them startled, and there were two more monsters that dropped his brother's belongings. His sister screamed his name out of concern. Wan was stunned and wondered what was happening. Because it has not been half an hour yet, they released the second round of monsters. The monsters landed on the ground, and the man shouted that they should have been informed if they changed the rules of the monster. The monster growled at them, and he noticed that they seemed to be rank two monsters. It seemed like they would try their best to prevent him from passing the exam. The big monster caught Xiao Shang's leg, causing another man to tell the girl to join them because Xiao Shang had already left and they would be in the same situation if they didn't leave. But Zoda tried to argue that her brother was not dead yet. However, the others fled while apologizing, and Wan also escaped, leaving Xing Kun and Scott to pull the big monster that lifted Xiao Shang to make him call his name. He then crashed into the monster, telling him to let go of his brother. But his efforts failed, and he fell to the ground. He thought they could be together, but now he realized they might die together. He screamed loudly while Xing Kun pulled him and asked if he was stupid. He suggested that if he wanted to die with someone, at least choose someone handsome, and his brother didn't fit the bill. He tried to reason with her, but she told him that she wouldn't let Xiao Shen be eaten. He instructed him to go there for a moment. Then he threw him to Wu Yin, telling him to catch Wan. He turned around, confused, and knocked him to the ground, thinking that the monster would eat Xiao Shang where they evolved to rank two. But to kill them, he had to do it by changing his left arm that the monster saw him, and he felt annoying. He ran towards the monster and suggested that they let him take Xiao Shang. Zoda was surprised because he was willing to take on three monsters just to save his brothers. Meanwhile, Wu Yin lay on the ground feeling dizzy. Zinam stopped running, confusing the monster and saying that it seemed they didn't see him as their enemy, as long as he didn't eat them. Then he hit the monster's arm while telling it to surrender the food, because he would do it. Delighted, he grabbed Xiao Shang before it fell to the ground, and told the monster not to be angry with him. Then he threw Xiao Shang to the corner while telling the monster so they wouldn't be hungry anymore after they bit it. Xiao woke up and fell to the ground, wondering if Zin would save him. The monster he was rolling around with said he was hurt and thought he would be happy to run towards him while he was coughing up blood. He told him that Zin could save them both, which made him feel like he owed a lot and wanted to say something unpleasant. He hit his head and asked if he was trying to hurt his brother. Then he seriously told him to stop fooling around and said they had to leave the testing area properly but he showed that his ticket was on the ground there, and he would try to pick it up after taking him to the testing room. He disagreed and said they should stop participating in the test because everything was getting weirder. He asked him to trust him, and at that moment he helped him walk to their room. Meanwhile, Zinka was busy dodging the monster's attacks. He asked the monster if they knew that the rank one monster liked them, 
and they would only survive for a day without using the Lord's fire. If he used it, he could kill one of them every ten seconds, but the cost was too high. He punched the monster in the stomach and told them that he needed to devour about one hundred of them if he wanted to evolve to rank three. He wondered why it was so difficult to evolve and asked them to let him devour them all. Then he realized that the door was open and assumed that the test would continue inside Xiao Shang's room. He was about to press the button when he told her that compared to their future, their lives were more important and the risks this time were greater than before. He pressed the button, but it didn't open, and he wondered if there was a power outage. Zota was terrified by what he saw when he looked back at him, and he told her to look behind her and see many monsters falling like rain into the testing area. He punched the participant holding the ticket and grabbed it, claiming it as his own. He put the ticket in his pocket while others tried to take it from him. He shouted that he wanted to become rich and retaliate against the evil people who had looked down on him. He glanced upwards and said he wouldn't let go, but then he saw the monster slam his rival to the ground. Then he looked around and saw the monster devouring and killing the other participants. He sat there in shock, wondering what was happening. There shouldn't have been so many monsters there at a higher level. L was watching them, he said. He destroyed the backup power source and there was no way back now. Everyone could blame Shing Kun for it. Li thought that if it weren't for Shing Kun, he wouldn't have taken the risk of releasing all those monsters. But he was angry when he saw Shing Kun staring at him and asking why he was laughing, lying annoyed and thinking that it was his place to be the safest right now. He gave Shing Kun the middle finger and thought he should thank him because without him, he will not be able to earn ten million when fighting the monster. He told her he would leave the country tomorrow and live a carefree life. Meanwhile, Shing Kun had just been eaten, when suddenly he threw the arm of the monster he was holding while lying, but it didn't hit him, which made Li confused, laughing and saying that Shing Kun couldn't throw properly. However, his arm flew backwards and hit the lie behind his head, screaming and not believing it was a coincidence. He fell in front of the monster, trembling, asking Shing Kun who was still fighting the monster to save him. He promised to share some of his winnings. Shing Kun replied that there were too many monsters, and he couldn't save others, let alone him. He inquired about her well-being to save her, and he would be lucky if you didn't accidentally throw one of them at her. He then playfully pushed the monster and grinned, saying he did it accidentally, pushing one towards her. It seemed like she would soon become their meal. The monster suddenly devoured the lie, growing tentacles behind its neck, and began sniffing the growls of the monster recognizing it as a traitor. Shing Kun also noticed another monster evolving beside it and thought as expected, its rank two monsters and so on were not foolish enough to not realize that he devoured their kind before. He then teasingly asked the monster not to gang up on him somewhere above. Chen was watching Shing Kun and thought that the task given by the Fan family was really not easy to accomplish, but he had to finish it. He smiled, thinking about it. Evolving monsters had already eaten more than 30 participants, and now there were none left. Three transgender stars will be able to make her come alive. Then she enters the gate and shocks the gold that holds her thinking. Now she just needs to go and close the last door that connects to the second level. Then she absorbs and the object that holds the door destroys her gate closes, and she thinks it's all over the entrance to the second level control room. The two people are unconscious. She splashes them with water and they slowly open their eyes. She angrily slams the mug she is holding and commands him to tell her what happened. She asks why there is a power outage in the testing area, yet why all power sources are being cut off because all the doors can't even be opened. The black-haired person answers that it's not their fault, because Lee dropped them all before, and surely the person destroyed all the main backup power sources, Chen. He instructed them to stop blaming others and saying that everything happened because they were lazy in their work. He ordered them to regain their strength because otherwise it would be a futile prevention. He asked how they could enter and save the participants if something happened. The man with black hair stuttered and replied that it would take at least half an hour to recover. Chen smiled and told him to do it, saying that God knows what worker Lee was doing earlier, 
The man with glasses told them to hold on for a moment and suggested that if they lied, they would release some monsters into the test. The reason they should inform the Department of Destruction headquarters to clean the land first. Chen was annoyed to hear this and told him that they would have to pay at least 100 million and they would have to take it out of their pockets. He asked what reason they used to drag them there, also asking if they could say they suspected a technician was making jokes and damaging some equipment there and then forcibly call the exterminator to destroy their main entrance. The building ordered them to stop fooling around and quickly regain strength. At least he was already smiling, thinking about it. It would take half an hour, and all that was left was the monster. He slowly released his left hand from his sleeve while the monster lunged towards him. He thought he should thank them all, because now he could finally transform without worry. Then he clenched his fist and ordered the monster to come to him and let him see everything for the last time. Later, he hit the monster with a flame of God while sincerely hoping they wouldn't have the monster gene in their next life. He burped, thinking he had eaten too much. Then he hit the monster in front of him and thought about all the energy. It was much more than he had expected because they had eaten a lot of participants who had not yet awakened, and he indirectly consumed the transcendent genes from the carrier. He thought he couldn't feel bad now and was free from his monster or transcendent genes, Everything still remains. The human genes are still there for him. He will consume them even if they taste bad. Only when he obtains enough power can he enter and defeat the demon god. If he doesn't enter hell, who will become the growling monster and call him a traitor before disappearing? He tells him to stay silent when he mentions his friend, not speaking to the monster because he is speaking to the original owner of their bodies. He also tells them, that they are the ones who stole his friend's corpse and called the monster a foreign parasite infiltrator. He will destroy them and the so-called king. Suddenly, he feels his left arm evolving again and thinks he is gaining energy from all the monster and transcendent genes. He thinks that from his experiences in his past life, which evolved into a rank three involving the brain first, the single connected monster is like the internet like a valuable 100 UN phone connected to the network. He also thinks that evolving to rank 3 now is like upgrading the 100 UN phone to a C000 UNU phone, as long as he can control all 100 UN phones and even search for phones worth more than 10,000 UN or even higher. Then he feels his connection becoming stronger and thinks he needs to decide to disconnect from the other monsters because if he can find them. They were also able to find it he began to find a cough and thought he needed to cut off his arm now, but it was too late. Then he saw Xiao Shang and Zoda trying to convince other participants saying Xing Kun was safe. They had not yet Xing Kun who was gravely injured now. Because of them, he asked people if they were his brothers in arms, then show loyalty and dare not take Xin's belongings kicked by the man Xiao Shang, and told him that they got it together just because they shared a common interest. If he really thought so, could God be upon them as their brother? He was just an idiot who could be influenced by some smooth words. Xiao Wen coughed up blood, and Zota anxiously called for him, while the man said it was their chance because there were only three tickets to continue studying. In the end, they would only kill each other for it. He asked if he was wrong. The man pointed towards Xing Kun and told Xiao Shang that he was not the one who asked him to kill those monsters. Shing Kun was injured because he thought he could handle it alone if he wanted to blame someone, then blame Shing Kun for wanting to be a hero. They approached Shing Kun and told him that they knew he was really hurt right now. They asked him to hand over his ticket if he didn't want to get hurt. They also suspected that he had taken the other two tickets and asked him to give them all to Xiao Shang. Xiao Shang told him not to do it and to move because he would deal with them. He couldn't let them hurt their saviors. Meanwhile. Wan called them from behind, shouting for Xiao Shang not to go because he would definitely get hurt. Xiao Shang turned around and asked if it was his property. His senses caught something in the man's question, whether Xing Kun should hand it over or they would take it themselves. Suddenly, a monster emerged from the ground, devouring the man whole. The other participants who were with him were stunned, asking what was happening and wondering if there was something wrong with their eyes. As he left, he trembled, looked up, and recognized the monster as the earth dragon.
The earth dragon's roar made them cover their ears, but they still fainted, their ears, eyes, and nose bleeding. The man remembered seeing this on the news once. Previously, a city in the south was completely destroyed by an earth dragon as it became a four-star local transcendent, while being outside the city when four transcendent stars from another area came to seek support, they almost failed to drive the earth dragon away. He knelt on the ground, thinking they were in trouble and wondering why they even cared about their ticket because everyone would die. Then the earth dragon swallowed him in one gulp. The earth dragon then attacked him. He thought it was interesting to draw attention to something strong after connecting with the monster. The network that dropped its leader was a heavy task with a long road ahead. The earth dragon hit him and they fell against the wall, but he managed to catch the earth dragon's attack in his hands. He realized that the difference in muscle strength was too wide. He couldn't hold it, and he needed to find a way to gain an advantage. Slowly, he released a small monster from the palm of his hand. He realized that the earth dragon was fair. Tentacles two minutes ago in the waiting room, the parents sat praying for their son and daughter to pass the exam. XU stood in front of his parents who were talking, thinking that the courtroom was the right place in front of them. He knew that the power inside had suddenly gone out earlier, and it had been more than ten minutes, and the electricity still hadn't come back. He wondered if this should be part of his trial. He walked towards the guards and told them that he was a new student at the Transcendence Academy. He felt something abnormal with the power inside the courtroom just now. His parents were shocked to hear this, and the guards wondered how XU knew about it. The guard asked him what he was talking about because everything was operating as usual inside. They asked him to return to his seat, or they would have to escort him to the waiting room. He told the guard that electricity was his ability that exceeded limits, and he could indeed sense something abnormal inside. Another guard shouted at him, asking which family member he belonged to, and reminding him that the area was only for family members of participants. Suddenly, he felt intense pressure and the parents of the participant fainted while sitting. The guard knelt down and wondered what was happening. Is there something wrong with him holding his chest and thinking about the power outage and feeling uneasy when realizing there must be a lady in there? He walked in while the guard told him he couldn't enter. He followed the electricity he felt and saw on his left, thinking it was the power recovery area, where a man was shouting at them to hurry and restore power because children were waiting inside. They opened the gate. He mentioned that the director said the gate on the second floor was also locked, so they would focus on restoring the gate on the first floor first. The man thought as if they were fixing things because everyone could feel the tremendous pressure coming from the door, a door that couldn't even be penetrated by missiles. He also thought there must be a terrifying monster inside and it would be a little safer with that door and its barrier. The Department of Destruction must have been informed as much. Chaos ensued, and they just needed to take the time to restore power until the exterminator arrived. XU got it inside and told them to let him handle the problem. The man asked him who he was and who let him in there. He was told that he was a new student at the academy who excelled with a 95% surpassing rate. His genes possessed electrical attributes and could help restore power within him. The man informed him that he didn't count, even if he was still a new student and hadn't reached the first level of transcendent status. He doubted if he had enough stored electrical energy and asked him how he thought he could restore his power. He instructed him to leave. G replied that he was right. He didn't have stored electrical energy. But as long as he was in the city, he would have an unlimited supply. Then he began to absorb electricity, and the man noticed visible electric particles emerging. He wondered where they came from and touched them, getting an electric shock in the process. As he looked around, he realized that there was electricity directly affecting his body in the cave, and he seemed not to feel any of it. And he wondered if it was whether he started to brighten up, and he thought he might be able to restore power to the facility. If it continued, he might try to open it up and he couldn't let it happen by chance. He also considered that he didn't do know what kind of monster appeared at the trial, but it had to be very dangerous inside him there to work, and he didn't want to take the risk of his life. 
He told her to stop because her powers were unstable and she could easily destroy the equipment there. He asked her if she really would stop him. She told him all that she knew that he was trying to hinder their work and damage their equipment, that he ordered the maintenance team to remove it immediately. The maintenance team aimed their weapons at him. While the man warned him not to act recklessly, they surrounded him and the man threatened to end it if he took one more step back at the testing site. He used the fire of God on the monster's teeth and realized that the earth dragon's teeth were not weak against the earth god's fire. The earth dragon bit his hand and tore it in two. He looked at his hand, wondering why the teeth were black because both were very offensive and defensive, but it turned out that they didn't even hurt him once and could still drain some of his genetic power if it continued its evolution to rank three. He avoided the earth dragon's attack thinking he needed to find a way to avoid those black teeth. Then he used his tentacles to wrap around the earth dragon's body, pulling himself closer. He realized that his tentacles couldn't penetrate its skin, but at least he could hold on to it while pulling himself. He considered using the fire of God to burn its outer layer and see if he could extract some of its flesh to consume. Suddenly, he was surprised to see that the earth dragon was balanced and able to grow the black teeth on its body. Its body penetrated the earth dragon's teeth, and it would use its maximum power output when it was in the earth dragon's body, intending to devour it and return to the power plant. The man thought that Gu was just a young college student who had to retreat after showing his strength. But he was worried that the academy might chase after him if he hurt Gu, so using a gun was not a good option. Suddenly he felt a punch in his hand and chest and the maintenance crew panicked and fired their guns towards Gu. He thought it was the security guard who got scared and fired their weapons, which were not possessed by those idiots. He controlled himself and was afraid that he would be held responsible for it. However, the bullets did not hit him, and he considered himself lucky but wondered if it was all fair based on luck. Gu looked at his hand and realized that such electrical circulation could create a magnetic field. The man also noticed that he was creating a very strong magnetic field around him, which deflected everything, including the bullets. He gathered his strength in his fingers, and the man's phone moved and flew towards Gu, along with another weapon. He ordered them to open the door now that all the electricity had been restored to the second level. Chen thought something was wrong inside and ordered his subordinates to quickly regain their strength. However, the man stated to her that the electricity had actually been restored, surprising Chen, and asked if what he meant was that the electricity had returned. Chen wondered what was happening and why the second floor repairs hadn't even started yet. She questioned whether the maintenance team on the first floor suddenly became energized and not only fixed the first floor lines, but also connected cables to the second floor. Its efficiency was not too high before so she asked them to check if the surveillance had found anything loose. Monster inside the man replied that he would open the gate to let everyone out first, making Chen think he was trying it on her. Chen clicked the button, and the gate slowly opened, while Xiu's door also opened. Chen rushed to see what was happening, and Zhu walked slowly towards the testing area. He saw Earth Dragon and was surprised by its safety. The guard wondered what that monster was, and one of them asked if they hadn't read the news because it was Earth Dragon. Ju noticed that Xing Kun was fighting Earth Dragon. Then he activated his power, causing Chen's facility to black out. She carefully peered down, wondering what was happening and why the electricity was flowing on the ground. Later, half of the city experienced a power outage at the destruction headquarters of the department. The girl's commander was called and reported a massive surge of electricity along the centralized cables around the testing site. She mentioned that it was likely caused by a new, uncontrollable entity. But considering the upgraded defense testing site, it should not cause widespread collapse. The commander asked if the exterminator ambulance and transcendent four-star from the institution were available to go there. She replied that the monitoring station in Kinshu had sent them immediately after detecting the earthquake and abnormal monster. Aura returned with Shing Kun, realizing that it was falling electrical debris and wondering if it was Ju. She smiled, thinking about how helpful a way, but before doing anything, 
she decided to eat the earth dragon first. She grabbed it tightly and tore into the dragon's flesh while making some distance. She thought she finally reached it and bit into it, then immediately ran towards Ju with the earth dragon following her. Chen, who was observing from above, realized that the task of the Fan family was not as simple as he thought. He believed that someone was definitely hiding something, but now appearance didn't matter. The Earth Dragon was a stroke of luck for her, as she managed to save Ju in time. Chan ordered two men to gather all individuals who possessed abilities beyond the limits quickly, and block the Earth Dragon before the exterminator arrived. He emphasized that under no circumstances should the Earth Dragon harm anyone outside, giving the remaining students a chance to survive. Both men agreed, and Chen smiled, thinking that no one could stop him now. At the testing site, Zinan was walking while holding Xu and realizing that the Earth Dragon had blocked everyone. He just had to wait a little longer. Suddenly, his hand grew larger, and he realized that the third stage of evolution was becoming even more intense. It was impossible to maintain human form. Then he felt something from his side and caught a sudden attack with his monster arm. Chen was impressed by this, and Zainan managed to catch his attack. However, he was surprised to see Zainan destroy his attack, and Chen demanded to know who he was. Chen Penli asked what it was and what kind of transcendent ability would result in such a transformation. Chen also shouted about the five main attributes, fire, wood, water, metal, and earth. Furthermore, he mentioned the special evolution of ice wind lightning and metal transcendence. None of the transcendent powers of their attributes should cause such a transformation in the arm, which Chen then used to pick up his broken weapon piece and wrap it around the barrier. When he finished, he destroyed the barrier and lifted it while shouting to Xing Kun that he didn't care who he was. Chen released the barrier towards him, shouting for him to die. He flew right behind him, but he twisted his demon arm in time and blocked it. Chen shouted that his arm was not something a human would have. Infuriated, he asked if he was actually a monster. Chen was shocked to see that his metal rod had pierced him, but the flames he emitted melted the metal rod. Chen asked if he was a fire-based transcendent because all monsters do not have attributes of their own. Then Chen realized that there was one possibility where monsters would have attributes, but he didn't want to believe it because he knew that it only applied to rank four monsters and above. He raised his large demon arm, grabbed Chen, and attacked him with it, making a breakthrough in the process. Unfortunately, Chen jumped just in time to avoid his attack and asked what he was. Then Chen shouted that he didn't look like a human, but he didn't look like a monster entirely. Chen realized that he couldn't kill Zingen quickly, but he thought it was no longer important because Zingen was a monster constantly changing its appearance. So, he just needed to wait a few minutes, and when the exterminators arrived, they would surely kill Zingen. Meanwhile, Zin's hand disappeared, went berserk, and tore him apart. Chen realized that evolving to the third rank was much harder than he thought, and he thought it was probably because he had just eaten some earth dragon. Just now, he realized that it was the same power as the Black Fang, and he knew that if he didn't tame it now, he would never return to his human form. He tried his best to control the demon arm, but suddenly Chen used his golden shield arm to wrap around himself, thinking that the monster in front of him was tough in terms of defense. However, his golden shield easily shattered into pieces, and he was hit by Jean's demon arm in the process. Chen was shocked and noticed that he had just been scratched by it. The black nail earlier made him wonder if it could really cause that much damage. Then Chen stared at him, wondering if he was a monster. He knew it belonged to his enemy's armor couldn't block the black nail in Chen's body. He also knew that he couldn't even survive for a moment because he would surely die there. Zingan attacked Chen, but he jumped away in time while telling him that it was better for him to stay there with him in his current condition. If he went out now, everyone would hunt him down. Since then, he was just a monster. A monster exterminator would soon arrive, and they would surely not let him go. Even though he was lucky to be with them, he remained a monster and an enemy to humanity, so no one would help him out there, said Chen, teasing him that every human out there would be happy to kill him themselves because a monster like him had to be eradicated.
Chen was shocked to see Jay behind him, Ju approaching Chen with his electric power, while he shyly asked him if he was active on Zhan's side. He told him that Xing Kun was a monster, but he had just told Chen that Xing Kun was not a monster because Xing Kun was Xing Kun. Then he attacked her with his electricity, while Chen timidly asked him if he knew what he was doing. He told her that he was betraying his own species, and he would regret his decision there. Suddenly, a Zingan appeared behind Chen with his demon arm sliding towards her, and told Chen that the world would not tolerate the existence of the monster he had just carved a bloody path for himself. He slammed Chen to the hard ground, shattering the earth in the process. Then, he timidly told Chen that she would be devoured, and he absorbed Chen. Suddenly, the floor vibrated uncontrollably, and when he looked up, he saw the earth dragon crawling in its making. He noticed that the exterminator was there. Then he told Jay to stay further away from him and pretended as if he did not know him because he did not know if he could bring back his left arm. Ju hugged his demon arm with a pout and firmly told him that he would stay by his side even if he himself would go to hell, smiling at the thought that in the end, that was how it was. Still, Shu then they heard someone shouting, urging others to enter as quickly as possible and save all the survivors they found making Gu wonder. The man believed that using the three transcendent attributes of the Earth's three stars as a shield should give them more time. He remembered the director's words they had to protect the civilians outside. Retreat was not an option at all. After the shield was destroyed, the man would silently disappear. However, he suddenly fled from the Earth Dragon, breaking the shield and cutting the guards into pieces. One of them passed by the scientists who screamed that the guards were dead. The defense formed by the three transcendent attributes of the Earth's three stars couldn't even withstand a single blow. The scientists knew it was impossible for them to have a chance against it. They noticed that even their director had disappeared. Then the scientists shouted that they had to get out of there. Meanwhile, the police tried to shoot the Earth Dragon. The Earth Dragon opened its mouth and shouted loudly, Everyone in the room fell to the ground in pain, feeling their heads splitting as the earth dragon was about to devour them. The scientist noticed someone and saw the female exterminator holding a pipe. At first, the scientist wondered who she was, but then he dismissed her identity and asked her to save them. She swung the pipe, releasing sharp water around her. While she was watching earth dragon, she swung her pipe towards Earth Dragon in anger and shouted that it was the one who interrupted her date, its flying attack towards the people causing panic and wondering if she really planned to kill them all. Her attack successfully pierced them. They couldn't believe that it managed to cut Earth Dragon so easily. They couldn't even harm Earth Dragon. No matter what they did at that moment, the scientists saw them severely injured Earth Dragon and realized that it was indeed an element dancing like a sprite but raging like a demon. It was the standard that had stopped the progress of countless transcendent three-star rankings, meaning it was a legendary symbol of a four-star that transcended the life elements. After she cut Earth Dragon, the people around could move, but then they noticed that Earth Dragon was quickly recovering. The scientists looked at the sweating woman knowing that she was the strongest guardian there, an institution for transcendent four-star transcenders with 91% transcender genes, Shang Guangkui. She walked forward and ordered the people to surrender it to her, commanding them all to evacuate those outside. They also had to provide details of the facilities and the situation inside to the exterminator at the entrance. They had to leave the rescue mission to those who answered yes, on the other side, at the testing ground. He asked her if she could return his arm back to normal. She replied that she would need it someday. She told him to hide for now, and she would help him later. He quickly ran into the barn to hide. Suddenly someone entered, and Ju called another exterminator, acting as if he was happy to save and report to them that he heard heavy breathing on the other side. He directed thorns on his demon arm to grow larger, making him realize that the third rank power was ten times stronger than the second rank power. He knew that the main reason a third rank monster was exceptionally large was to contain the monster gene rampage so he thought he needed to keep pressing his power to fully regain his human form. He decided to let his bones evolve stronger first. 
But then he noticed that it was the 1% transcendent gene he received on his first day of reincarnation. He wondered if they absorbed the transcendent gene he had just eaten from Chen, or if it was because they both had any metal elements. Whatever he realized, the 1% transcendent gene had awakened. He decided to try to stabilize the monster gene with the help of that transcendent gene and direct them to controlled development. He developed his bones first, but was surprised to feel that his strength was similar to the black dragon's teeth. Then the thorns on his demon arm grew larger, reaching the ceiling. On the other side, the exterminator caught Wu Yin, who had fainted, and thanked him for his cooperation because they were able to easily find the three survivors. He replied that they were welcome, while wondering why they had suddenly arrived so quickly. They heard a loud noise in one of the cells, and the exterminator immediately looked into it, asking what it was and if it was a monster. Ju panicked upon realizing that the Shing Kun would soon be discovered. He tried to stop the exterminator, but one of them told him to be quiet and explained that any noise would attract the monster's attention. He looked at the exterminators in despair and swore to the Shing Kun that even if forced out of society, he would accompany her wherever she went. The exterminators carefully walked into the cell, but when they came out, he had turned into a fully human form and apologized to the exterminators. Then he explained to them that he had just woken up from fainting and asked them what had happened. The man told his companion that he was human, not a monster, and assured them that he scared them. He then reported to their captain that they had found a total of five survivors there. While Ji whispered and asked him if he was okay, he confidently replied that he was fine. Only then did he notice his arm and realized that he had successfully developed all the bones in his body to resemble those of the Earth Dragon. But the black teeth of the Earth Dragon could still not be compared to reality. So he thought it was still weak. Then he confronted the man who questioned his captain's disbelief that the Earth Dragon had retreated and reported it. They would bring out the survivors realizing that humans were actually just as weak because they didn't know that the Earth Dragon was only a transcendent four-star being, and the only thing it could overcome was a small protruding tentacle from the main body of the demon god and the hidden monster deep underground, beyond human comprehension. So he knew that he needed to gain more power as soon as possible because he had to save himself before saving others. He knew that he needed the power of the Gen Power Resource, and he needed to make it so that he could become strong. No one is unbeatable in the world except for him, but he also knows that before all of that, he must hide among the transcendent beings the next day, in the place where Shing Kun is destroyed. He dreams of holding a man's head and slowly squeezing it before the man dies. He sees the demon god coming out from underground suddenly. Shing Kun wakes up and thinks that there is not much time left for them. Ju asks him how long he will think there and tells him that he has been staring at someone else since he set foot on the school grounds. He asks him if he means 36D and how it could be when he has long regretted his sins. Before that, he explains to him that it is not what he meant when he said it. There is not much time left for him there. Teasingly, he answers, All right then. He tells him that the world as they know it will undergo extraordinary changes in the coming years, so he must develop himself into a transcendent five-star before all of that happens, and the earlier the better. He asks him if it is really only one year, and tells him that as far as they know, a four-star ranking is the highest and strongest ranking in the world. They do not even know how strong the five-star transcendent rating is. He also told them that they need to work much harder and much harder than when they took the entrance exam in college. He told her not to worry about it because he would help her with it. She answered okay and told him that she trusted him. Then he grumpily told her that he trusted her with everything except he said he had repented because of his selective ways. He told her that first she had to evolve herself into a transcendent three-star within one month and he told her that she currently has 95% of genes that surpass within her. He reminded her that they said the more transcendent genes they have, the more resources they need during this initial stage, and asked where they could find so many resources, when suddenly they did not have a strong background. Xiao Shang should have called him brother, 
and proudly told him that it was only because of his aid that he, Zi, and Wu Yin managed to survive the final exam. They have the opportunity to continue learning in institutions and schools, make exceptions, and reward everyone who survived. It seems as if they have overcome the trial itself, so they owe a lot of gratitude to it. Xiao Shang then told them that since that day, he belonged to their leader, and they were ready to serve him until death separated them. Tempting him by telling him that he had successfully obtained a man who served him now, and he could see that he had truly evolved, telling him that he had repented and changed his ways. Xiao Shang asked him who the girl next to him was and told him that he always wanted to ask him about it, but he never got the chance since they were saved during the final test. He answered that it was Gu, and he waved at them while greeting them both, surprised to hear his name. Xiao Shang exclaimed that Gu was one of the strongest new students in their academy a transcender with 95% of genes that exceeded the highest recorded amount in history since its establishment. Prodigy XU has just informed XU that he thinks they overreacted a little. Xiao Shang yelled at him, telling him that he expected more from him and asked if they wanted to do it. They both were a couple that made them both look at each other in silence. Then they both answered no, and it turned out it didn't happen. Then they both said that to them explaining something is always like that, annoying, but it's just childish friend, and they all think that no one will believe them because they even share the same baggage that Wu Yin told them about. They are childhood friends who can form a group together, and he has advice for them. Wan explained that the institution will conduct a resource competition for each new batch of students after they successfully enroll. Each new student will be given a set of resources, and they will compete against each other for the next three hours using their own abilities. It is suggested that they form a temporary team so that their spiritual feelings can help them avoid the best talents among the new students, and they may avoid having their resources seized by others or even have their resources taken by their classmates. Xiaoshang shouted at us to be quiet and asked him if he was trying to hurt their brother. Wan replied no, and that was not his intention. Xiaoshang told Wan that the students were currently on an advanced list as well as the new students with low grades. Transcendent Gen is always more likely to be a specific target for that generation. He asked why, and if their classmates did not inform them earlier about the prodigy, who was tested to have 88% surpassing genes during his high school graduation, and has now become a new leader. Xiao Shang also told them that their goal is to steal all the resources from those who have less than 50% surpassing genes because it is indeed difficult for those with less than 50% surpassing genes to awaken like him with 39% transcendent genes, and Zhao, who only has 41 surpassing genes. Even Wan has just passed the 50% surpassing gene bar compared to Xiao Shang. He shouted that they absolutely did not want to burden their brother Zingen, while Zingen and Zhu looked at each other. He told her that it was stealing resources and asked her, is it not the first collection of resources they enter? He answered that they even came with some little cuties as well, and he referred to them as bait, and he answered that as long as they nurture it, the help they can provide will save them a lot of effort. Then he smiled and told them that he could help them become the second power generator after they are all over the school, if not the world like that. They could also reach their peak and be willing to help them eliminate any obstacles but he smiled, punched his chest, and asked him if it was not just a team that used a chain of friendship. Then he told them that they had to work together to make Xiao Shang shocked and panicked. He told him that he did not need to feel sorry for them like that. He seriously told Xiao Shang that it was not for any other reason, and that he was willing to work together with them because they were loyal and very useful. But he clarified that what he meant could be relied upon. Partner Xiao Wen cried in relation but he told them that. Since they joined the team, their goals may have changed. Only a small Xiao Shang told him that since he had high hopes for them, they would certainly not disappoint him, and they would follow his instructions in everything. He smiled and told them that he suddenly thought of a possibility. If someone accidentally acquired all the resources from everyone, then wouldn't those resources all belong to them alone? Why not think about it? It doesn't sound right but he laughed and told them not to worry too much because that's just how it is. 
Just curious, he told them that they should go to the dormitory and get their luggage sorted. Jay also told them that it was their first class. The next night, everything they agreed to live by in the dormitory building. When Xiao Shang asked him how many genes surpassed him, he answered that he would find out soon and it might surprise him. Then, Xiao Shen excitedly told Wan the percentage of genes that surpassed Xin was definitely very high. Later, a person entered in front of them, introduced himself as Bo Liang, and told them that he would be their basic teacher for the coming year. Bo Liang also informed the students that he would be clear from the beginning that if they could not awaken them beyond their strength in that year, they must leave the transcendent institution. And those who returned from the last session, then Bo Liang told Wu Yin that he could see that he had awakened his mental attributes beyond his strength and perception of danger very suitable for 50% of his weak genes. The next observation students with 39 and 41% surpassing Zhen Zhe Shang proudly answered yes back, and Zi shyly mentioned that he was indeed there. Bo Liang told Zhang and Zi that if they still could not awaken their abilities in that year, they must go and live as ordinary people for the rest of their lives. They made everyone in the room laugh at them. But Jiang answered that he would do his best. He asked Jiang if he was Bo Liang's teacher, and Jie Shang explained that as long as he had not awakened, and his Gen percentage exceeded less than 50%, Bo Liang would only call him based on his percentage. Boang told them that their generation was quite special. Assuming they had already seen the report that individuals with the highest transcendent number of genes in human history were one of the batches, and their future was unimaginable, everything including himself, as a... However, what surprised the teacher most was the fact that there was someone in their class with genes that exceeded his percentage by only 1%. Then Bo Liang called the 1% student who was no different from an ordinary person to stand up and let everyone know him. The students looked around, wondering who he was. Jay Shang told him that it was already very difficult to be part of the 1%, and that person would surely become the target of all the students. However, he still stood up and told Bo Liang that he had already done it, awakened, and it was a power that surpassed the elements of metal, surprising Jen. Bo Liang asked if only 1% had already surpassed the Jen holder, and told him that if that was the problem, he should step forward and help the teacher in his lesson. He walked down the stairs while telling Bo Liang that there should be a reward for his help in teaching. Bo Liang answered that he would receive additional shared resources during the post-competition class resources, and he thanked Bo Liang for it. Bang Ji told him not to do it, and thanked him for being a carrier of the 1% gene. With two sources of resources, it may soon become a nightmare, but he is fair in telling everyone that surpassing the power refers to the ability of elementals such as metal, wood, water, fire, earth, ice, wind, mental, lightning, and more. They awaken the power of these elements through transcending their genes, being able to control their extraordinary genes and store external elements within them. Bo Liang tells him that when he can prevent his elements from disappearing and transform his transcendent genes into a perfect battery, he will succeed in becoming a transcendent star, Bo Liang. Then, he takes a large piece of metal from under his desk, saying it as a demonstration. First, they need a piece of metal ball, explaining to him that the elements that can be done by transcended genes have limited capacity, so if he only has 1%, then he only has that much. Bo Liang takes a smaller piece of metal and throws it at him, explaining that in his lifetime, he can only control a small amount of that metal and instructs him to play with it for a while. He gazes at the piece of metal and finds it strangely familiar, so familiar that he also knows that it is true. High-level monster things gradually acquire after a while, making him wonder if the pinnacle of monster evolution is to become someone who surpasses limits. The crazy person tells everyone that they all have mysterious genetic chains, and whether they become monsters or transcend depends on whether the genetic chain mutates into a monster genetic chain or an explosion of genetic chains that surpasses limits. They tell everyone they're luckily they are all transcendent beings whose mysterious genetic chains have mutated into chains that surpass, and their surpassed genetic chain context determines their future achievements. The more their genes surpass, 
the more sensitive their perception becomes, making it easier for them to manipulate. They acknowledge that there is not even a little justice in it, but that's how the world works. B's work explains it starting from 90%. Every additional 1% of surpassed genes brings a significant increase in their operator's abilities. For example, Shang Guangqi himself can breathe underwater with 91% surpassed genes, and his classmate Gu can withstand at least 3,000 volts of electricity without any problems. Everyone who exceeds the gene operator by 100% will appear as if they will be called gods. On the contrary, the lower the percentage of genes that exceed them, the lower their sensitivity to the elements that make it harder for them to process. Also, there is no record of individuals who have less than 20% exceeding the gene resurrection before the appearance of Zinum. He then asked Bo Liang if that's what he meant, and when Bo Liang looked at him and told him that if that was the case, he couldn't utilize his metal attribute, he could help him. Bo Liang was surprised to see that he had turned the metal into gold. Then he told Bo Liang that he could get it in and out of his body without any problems, making Bo Liang not believe that he succeeded with such skill and realizing that his resurrection was unfair. Bo Liang's unintentional miracle told him that it seems he also has the wisdom of one in a million or a stroke of luck once in a lifetime. Bo Liang released a powerful metal element while telling him that he would teach him another truth, which he explained that the difference between 1% and 80% is like 80 people conspiring in unity. Therefore, there is no need for tactical formations because having a crowd of individuals that surpasses limits has already become such an extraordinary advantage. It also informs him that just like that, his strength will easily be destroyed, and people with should always be fewer transcendent genes. Realize that they are the weaker ones, so if he is weaker, he must hide behind the strong. This makes all the students pay attention to them in surprise, but he just smiles remembering that he was once killed by his hands at a critical moment of life and death. Bo Liang sacrificed his life for his students, giving them enough time to avoid it, making him think that Bo Liang is indeed an amazing teacher. But then he sees Bo Liang sweating profusely. He realizes that he is feeling a little pressure now, making him wonder if Bo Liang is trying to subdue him with his genes that go beyond limits. He knows that his genes that go beyond limits devour Chen's genes beyond the previous ones, and it has already turned him into a big fat man now so Bo Liang will not be able to subdue him. However, he knows that he will not do it because he needs to be a little more humble. If not, he wonders what he will do if other students come and bully him. Then he releases himself from the piece of metal in his hand and acts as if he falls, telling Bo Liang that he can't hold on any longer. But Bang knows that he is defeated by him. The goal is to make Bo Liang ask himself if he can't subdue him. The students cheer for Bo Liang. While teasingly mentioning Xing Kun's weakness in resisting temptation, Bo Liang looked up and realized that he could hardly protect his own reputation. Bo Liang smiled, thinking about the secrets that Xing Kun possessed and how Xing Kun knew who he was interested in. Bo Liang then thanked Xing Kun for his demonstration, telling him that it was all for their first basic lesson. Bo Liang explained that the philosophy of their school was survival of the fittest where the winner takes all that they ask for. They were all prepared, and Bo Liang instructed them to let the competition for resources among the new students begin. The man told Bo Liang that they had done it before and were ready for a while. Arrogantly, he said that he just didn't know if it was accurate. The man happened to overhear Bo Liang's arrogant words when he came to school today, and he wondered where that 1% surpassed him. The man also told everyone what Xing Kun said, that he wanted to bring them all down and see all their resources, which he believed was truly daring to the extreme. The man jumped up from his seat while telling the surprising story of Xing Kun's success with just 1% surpassing the genes. It made him think that way too, as he had made extraordinary efforts. The man then introduced himself as Yucking and informed him that he had surpassed 85% of the genes and he was an attribute of transcendent water. Xing told him that he greatly admired his perseverance in shouldering that burden. Although inferior, Jean was still able to break through and awaken. Xing informed him that he would make an exception to invite him to join them at that time. 
Xing proudly told him that they were indeed gathering students who exceeded the 60% gene level and forming a strong Xing alliance. He reached out to him, telling him that together they could fulfill their plans and see all the resources from the weak. In reality, Ching thought that way when he joined. His girlfriend, Ju, who had the most transcendent genes in history, would definitely join them too. Then the king told him to let the resources fall into their hands, where they could maximize their use rather than wasting them on the weak. However, he only replied that it was funny, and told Ching that in the end, he only dared to oppress the weak with their power. Xing angrily asked him who he thought he was and reminded him that he was just trash, with only 1% surpassing the genes that he didn't even have the qualifications to enter the Transcendence Institute to begin with. Xing also told him that he was able to pass the final exam only because Gu saved him at that time, so he shouldn't think that he didn't know that old information. He called him trash, who didn't know his place, but invited him solely because he would bring Ju with him. He told Ching with a smile that he made a painful blow. Xing looked at him angrily and told him to just wait, because their strong alliance would definitely seize all the resources from the weak side. He liked teasing Xin, hoping that he would be lucky, and he would pray that they would make Xing leave angrily. Bo Liang asked him if that was his deliberate intention to provoke Xing, and he answered no. Then he explained that he sincerely encouraged Xing which made Bo Liang silent for a moment. Then Bo Liang told everyone that they should start the competition for the new student resource allocation. He ordered all the students to come and receive their resource exchange tokens and gather in the forest outside the school for further instructions. Bo Liang gave him two tokens, and then in the forest outside the school, Bo Liang told the students not to leave the forest, giving them one hour to do whatever they liked. He emphasized that everything would depend on their abilities from there and stated that it starts now. Jay Shang confidently suggested that they meet Zin, but Wan apologized for not going. Jay Shang asked why, what did he mean? And Wu Yin answered that he still had to think about it himself. Wu Yin told Jay Shang that even though his genes exceeded the limit by only 49%, making an exception to let him join the alliance since he did. Jay Shang, awakened, reminded Wan that Zin would take them further in life, but Wu Yin apologized and said that even though Zin was indeed very strong, he was only at 1%. Also, Zin fought against the entire alliance, so he really did not expect Zin to provoke them directly from the start. Jay Shang angrily called Wan a traitor, but Z instructed him to understand that everyone has their own ambitions, no need to force them. Watched by more than 10 people who surpassed them, they couldn't blame Wu Yin for backing out of one of Zin's 1% student calls and told him that he could only laugh for now, and they would remain close, watching him. He couldn't go anywhere, and Ching would be back soon, meaning it would be his turn to cry. But Zin just smiled and told the man that after all the intimidation in a week, it wouldn't take much time. The man angrily asked him what he meant and told him that it was called efficiently utilizing resources later. A woman kept running continuously in the forest and hid behind one of the trees, thinking she had run far enough and it should be safe for now. However, Xing appeared behind him and told him that no one could escape his detection since about 70% of the human body consists of water. He ordered him to hand over his resource exchange token and he would make things a little less painful for him. The woman refused, stating that the resource belonged to her and asked him why she should give it to him. He instructed her to blame herself for not wearing strong enough jeans to join their alliance, and drowned the woman with his water manipulation. She surrendered, and told him that she would hand it over after she reached her breaking point. He left the resource she left behind to target and drown other weak students for their resources. On the other side, other weak members of the Qing corner defeated them to obtain their resources. Suddenly the man appeared in front of Ching and asked her if she already had all the resources she thought she deserved. Ching knew that the man was a fan fan Shi Zai and told Shay that he had not done so yet and came looking for her. However, he has realized that instead Xing later told Fan Shi Zai that they should test whether he, the young master of the fan family, 
even qualifies to join their Shea Alliance without undergoing genetic testing and enrolling in school through the back door. Shea responded that it was a coincidence because it was his thought as well. Shea released a large fire from his hand and told Ching that they should see if he qualifies to become his subordinate. Xing retaliated with his water power while asking Fan Shizai if he used to be a young master as well, and daringly thought he could waive his position as a young master of the Fan family wherever he went. But then, Shizai's glowing hand just flew past him through the water, making Ching wonder if water shouldn't be able to counter the attack, and thinking that Shizai's strong black marsh should not easily evaporate. On the other hand, Zin saw the weak ones fleeing while screaming at the intruders to return their resources and just waiting for them to grow stronger so they could settle it once and for all. Zingan thought it was a bit slow, but he was glad that they had at least finished harvesting now. The Xing members asked the weak student if they were foolish and who would wait for them to grow stronger. Then they told them that it was a dog eat dog world, so if anyone couldn't accept that, they had to keep moving forward and become stronger. The man looked at Tim Zin and said that they just had to wait for the king to return and they could harvest the last remaining tokens. Then the man teasingly asked Zin if he was afraid and told him that if it weren't for G.U., he would leave. But then the man noticed the electricity and saw G.U. meditating, making him think that 95% of the G.U. gene carriers must have done something purposeful. He wanted to stop it, but someone blocked his attack with just one hand, telling you that they had been caught and he needed better control of his powers. Then he asked her how long she still needed to prepare, and she answered that she needed one more minute. The man realized that Zin's arm was made of metal and he couldn't move even a bit. The man pondered if there was something wrong with Xing Kun and wondered what it meant. One minute later, at Boliang Academy, he heard the electricity go out, which made him think that from that semester onwards, the institution's electricity bill would exceed its budget significantly. However, Boliang smiled, thinking that they would just let it be. The apartment's financial department was worried about it. Meanwhile, in the forest, the man squeezed Shing Kun's hand and told him that since then they had been exposed and should not hide their location anymore. He had to prepare himself because they were all going to be electrocuted. Man L screamed in pain and immediately instructed his members to do it quickly and stop Shing Kun because he was going to electrocute them all to death. The man ran towards them and told the man to do it quickly, lower it by 1%, and then asked him what he was waiting for, to kneel down and deceive himself like that. However, Shing Kun had just reached out and squeezed someone else's hand asking Ji why he hadn't let go yet. Ji replied that there was one more person, the one he had shouted at, and the other members should be careful because he was very strong. He ordered his awakened members to use all their transcendent abilities, and then people ran to attack him. He inquired Jay about the identity of the person, to which Jay replied that it was a man named Yukin. He then reassured Jay not to worry as he had already spread his particle electricity through the wind for a while. Soon after, he found Xing and saw that a transcender with water attribute was fighting against a transcender with fire attribute. He then mentioned to those with less than 60% surpassing genes to listen to him, instructing them not to talk nonsense, as he would help them seek revenge. He also informed them that he would take all the resource tokens from the troublemakers, ensuring that their starting points would be the same as before, and everyone could work harder. Next time, he advised the troublemakers not to think about walking away, as they already had static electricity in their bodies that would eventually shock them. Regardless of what happened, he knew that the movement was that technique. Ju told him that he had evolved since the previous timeline. Ju then used a targeted thunder attack to strike them all. On the other side, She pressed Ching with his glowing hand, but Ching still tried to protect himself using his water shield. Xing shouted to Fan Shizai that he couldn't defeat him with just the fire flame, but She simply smiled and rose. While handing over his hand, She informed Ching that he did indeed come. Then She closed his glowing hand, 
reaching out to Shing, who couldn't shake him off even with his water element power. Shea raised his hand and then slammed Ching to the ground with force. Fan Shirzai swung his hand to the side and asked Ching, who was inside the flaming hand, if he thought he could hold on for a full minute. Shing realized that he couldn't do anything, because the power gap between them was too wide, and he thought it was unfair. Shiz opened his palm, releasing Raja. Then Fan Shizai told Shing that he had passed his test, and he and his alliance were qualified to participate. Shing asked She what he meant by passing the test when he couldn't even fight back. She answered that he had already reached the status of a three transcendent star, so in terms of power, he could easily surpass the institution. The fact that he could protect himself with his water attribute ability under his fiery hand without being disabled was good enough. Shing asked him why he was there if he had already become a three transcendent star, and he answered that they were all competing for resources now, but those things were already in his grasp. Then he offered his surrender to Ching and explained that that's why he was there, to help recruit young, talented fans like him. Shing should not worry about it because he can convince her that the fan family will treat everything exceptionally. Both talents are based on the individual's desired abilities, allowing for faster growth than their own. However, justice is not easily obtained in an unfair world. Then he asked Ching if she accepted it, which of course was answered by Ching reaching out to Shay's hand and saying that she would accept the sudden lightning that flew past the fainted student on the ground, heading straight towards Ching and Shay, who were surprised. Then lightning struck Ching giving her an electric shock, and Jay flew into the air, hunting down every student there. She looked around, wondering if it was Gu, and saw Shin trembling in pain on the ground above him, saying that he couldn't move him. He walked towards them as he ordered Yang and Zad to gather all the resources, signaling towards another direction, and telling them not to worry because they couldn't move an inch for the next move. At the appointed time, he greeted Fan Shizai, and told her that it was not as easy as she thought to disarm her weapon. Xing shouted that the electricity hitting him was strong, and Shizai called Gu, but he told her that they didn't need to talk because he never joined his group. Fan Shizai told her that he would only tell her one thing. Then She released his, turned on the PA once again, and told her that he respected her decision, and would wait until she made the right decision. He gently pushed Gu back and told her to leave first and rest for a while, while because Shay was not an opponent he could defeat now, he also told her that she did need to test her transcendent abilities when they were on it, and he jumped to meet Shiza. Shiza's glowing palm strike hit the hard ground causing a loud explosion, and Fan Shizai angrily bowed down thinking that he hit her anyway. Shay was surprised to see her quickly appear in front of her, teasingly calling Shiz young master and telling her that she seemed a little nervous and asked her if that was true because no one had ever had the chance to get that close to her. Shay raised her hand and called her a foolish and arrogant person. Then Fan Shizai tried to grab her with her glowing palm, while telling her that it was expected from someone who had 90% of surpassing genes that he could imagine two very large and energetic fires consuming. However, Zin tried to jump to the side in time to avoid it, but then Shay's glowing palms cornered him, and Fan Shizai told him that he had nowhere to run. She combined his glowing palms, and the palms captured Zin, who was still motionless on the ground. Shin told Fan Shizai that he could now see his true power, but by doing so, he would actually be the one to kill Zin. Fan Shizai reassured Shing not to worry because Zin would not be killed like that. He knew that Zin was someone who had managed to survive the final test. Then Zin appeared out of nowhere and jumped towards Fan Shizai, making Shin unable to believe that the flaming palms failed to capture Zin. He thought that once Zin was caught, everything would be over. But Shay just smiled and used his flaming palms. The palms spread out and became very small. Zin looked at them, thinking that there were more now, but they were smaller in size. Then he activated them 1% beyond the usual slash of a golden sword and slashed the attack of the flaming palms. Fan Shizai noticed that he was very familiar with real-life fights, a skill that he seemed to have just awakened. This made Shay wonder why Zenin suddenly appeared in front of Fan Shizai 
and came close to cutting him with his sword, except Shay dodged it. Then Shay noticed that the golden sword he controlled was sharp, and he knew it was not a good idea to cause death in a school, which meant it was difficult to avoid getting hurt. But one wrong move and Zin would end up with irreparable damage. Fan Shizai decided to use only 90% of his power, surpassing the strength to directly attack Zin's 1%, and defeat Zin, surpassing the genes and destroying them from within. She thought that at some point, Zin had already exceeded his limits. If the gene breaks within him, it will take at least a year or more to recover, and desire will no longer be a thorn in his side. Then, he confusedly looks at Fan Shizai and observes Fan Shizai surpassing the gene, asking himself how Fan Shizai became so incredibly powerful. He believes that Fan Shizai is someone who has just awakened, and Fan Shizai resembles his uncle Transcender's four-star rank. Then he acts as if he falls again, shouting that Fan Shizai is also so strong, making Fan Shizai wonder what he is doing. He then stands up and tells Fan Shizai that he is truly the strongest among them in that generation, humbly admitting defeat and feeling that he should not continue the fight. An hour later, Bo Liang meets them and tells them that the competition is over. Now, he hopes that everyone will gain something different through the competition. Bo Liang, who was instructed by the students to submit their tokens to him, will allocate resources to their teams. The team is disappointed and frustrated. Then, Xing Kun gives the token to Bo Liang, explaining that it seems they accidentally acquired all the tokens, totaling 78. He asks Bo Liang if he minds counting them. Bo Liang takes the tokens from him, telling him that it's quite bold of him and that it seems his group has officially become the target of many. While laughing, Dia answered that she would make sure to get along harmoniously with her classmates. Then Bo Liang asked if there was still one left with Fan Shizai. Fan Shizai searched in his pocket, but Shei, confused, asked where his token had gone. Fan Shizai replied that he forgot and explained to Bo Liang that when Fan Shizai defeated him, he saw the remaining token exchange resource on the ground, so he picked it up. Fan Shizai angrily told him to shut up and not call him Fan Shizai. Dia apologized to Fan Shizai and handed him the token, asking if he wanted to take it back. But Fan Shizai turned around and told him to keep it for now, swearing that he would get it back later in the resource department. He informed Jay Shang and Zato that they would give them six portions and the rest would still be Jang's. Zhang cut him off, telling him to say no more because the total of six portions was already 42 life essence fluid, which was a very valuable treasure just for them. He told him that they would definitely appreciate it and strive for it. He told Zhang that it was good that he understood, and then Zi called him and told him that he had something he wanted to ask him. But Jay Shang told him that his little sister called Paul wanted to ask him something. He informed her that he knew she could have actually defeated Fan Shizai and asked her why she deliberately lost to him. She replied that Chisai was the young master of a powerful fan family, and since then they already had the resources they needed, there was no need to rush defeating Fan Shizai so quickly. Jang exclaimed that she was amazing. A few minutes later, Jang told her that they had arrived at the dormitory, but she kept walking. Jang informed her that she was going the wrong way because the direction she was heading was towards the women's dormitory, and his dormitory was not there because he was in the same room as her. He pointed to the women's dormitory and told Jay Shang that she was going there because the school provided specially designed individual dormitories for people with very high transcendence genes to prevent them from accidentally hurting their classmates. Jay Shang answered that he knew, but it was Jay's dormitory. Z hit his head and asked how he could be so slow in making Zhang realize that it was his sister's dormitory, which was a term used for the girlfriend or wife of their older brother. Then, Jay Shang bowed to them and bid them good night as he continued walking, telling Jay that he had already informed them that they were his childhood friends. He told her that he taught her how to absorb resources as quickly as possible, which indeed required the whole night, and while laughing, he told her that it seemed like he hadn't spent the whole night in the same room with her since high school. Ju, while laughing, called him a womanizer and reminded him that after high school he was always a mess in his relationships. Then she asked him who would want to stay with him, and he told her that she had opened a new chapter for him and advised her to do what she did.
He answered that he was fine now, making Ju feel embarrassed, and she agreed that he had really changed a bit from before. A moment later, in Jay's room, he explained to her that he was becoming an overwhelming presence that exceeded limits. Humans in the world are starting to learn about their powers and trying to replicate them, while humans are still unable to artificially recreate the powers they are capable of using biological sources, such as animals, and extracting a substance called the essence of life. He explained to her that the substance is commonly used to replace the consumption of superhuman powers. Then he drank the potion in the bottle while telling her that it sounded like a man-eating monster, but when he drank it, it was completely useless and did not satisfy his hunger at all. Then he sat down and explained to her that people from the resource department said it is better to drink one bile a day, in line with the body's natural absorption and repair rate. But offering the best use, he told her not to worry about it, and that she didn't need to think about saving electricity bills at school, so she had to go all out and advance herself to the rank of one star as quickly as possible. Then he leaned closer to her body and told her to give him a jolt and let her feel if there was any trace of electricity.